So we're really excited to uh, welcome Tamara Peters of Resilient Neighborhoods. She conceived and led the development of Resilient Neighborhoods, a program helping households do two things, go on a low carbon diet and lose 5,000 pounds in 60 days, and build a more resilient community that can better withstand the potential disruptions of climate change. Last year, over 100 Marin households surpassed expectations by reducing 1.3 million pounds of carbon. Welcome, Tyron. Thanks and hi, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here with all of you and celebrating Earth Day um, at Earth Day Marin. And Earth Day is something that's been very important to me my whole life. Back on April 27, 22nd, 1970, the first Earth Day, um, I celebrated that and was so excited about it. I got my first job two months later at a group nobody had heard of called the Nature Conservancy. And I was there for 11 years. And during that time, it grew from a staff of 15 across the country to 350 and started an international program. So um, from my perspective, um, the, you know, I feel like really good that I've been part of the environmental movement and seeing all the changes through the years, even now it's just like accepted all over the world that there's an environmental movement. I wanted to share two experiences with you about um, why I have hope that we can do something about climate change and why I believe we can do something about it here in Marin. First thing was um, back in 1987, I was working at NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council, and uh, a man named David Donner, who was head of the, their air program, came to San Francisco. I was doing fundraising at the time and I was supposed to be familiar with all the issues. So um, I asked David to go out to lunch with me and explain the difference between CFCs and GHGs. So um, we went out to lunch and he took out a napkin and he drew a circle around it and he said, this is the Earth. And then he drew another circle around that and he says, this is the ozone layer. And CFCs, chloral fluoral carbons, are eroding the ozone layer, creating a hole and it's the ozone layer that protects us from ultraviolet radiation, and if it goes away all around the world, everything will die, basically. That was scenario number one. Scenario number two, he talked about climate change, and he drew an Earth, he said, this is the Earth, and then he drew a circle around it, and says, these, this is like a blanket around the Earth, and this is, this is greenhouse gases that are being trapped inside and heating up the Earth, and if we don't do something about that, we're basically all going to die. So that was our cheery lunch. Um, but the point I want to make is um, in 2012, after everybody in the world got together to do something about the ozone layer depletion, 2012 was the smallest the world has been in the last several decades. The world took action. The world did something about it. And we can do something about climate change globally. And I know many of you are taking actions with citizen climate lobby and doing things, um, signing letters and doing things on the national level. Locally, uh, I was involved, got involved in the 2008 election campaign. I volunteered and was running the, um, a phone bank on 4th Street, San Rafael for swing state phone bank calling. Anyway, towards the end of that campaign, Marin County had 13, just coming to our phone back, had 1,300 callers. 1,300. And we had to rent more space, and there was a spillover and all that. The point is, towards the end of the election, the national campaign was looking for cities, places in the country where the phone banks were doing the best job. And they selected a number of them from around the country. They chose Marin County, our San Rafael phone bank. Now, we have a population of 250,000, right? They chose Berkeley in the East Bay, San Francisco, Los, you know, Los Angeles, but they chose us because the people in this county, when there's a passion, they put that passion into action and they do something. And we also have Marin Clean Energy. So those are examples of why I believe that we can do something here to make a difference. And now I'm going to tell you about resilient neighborhoods. 
and what you can do. I have to figure out how to get situated here to see the, the slides and point the projector. This is, um, this is kind of leading into what I'm going to be talking about. Um, taking a look at our own carbon footprint, moving from the big national down to local. And I don't know if you can read it, the blue car there is the blind spot express. Like we're always focused on what everybody else can be doing as opposed to what can we do ourselves. Take a look at this, Marin County. These are ecological footprints from around the world. Um, on the left is the global acres per person. It would take, it, every person in Marin County uses 27 global acres. Um, the green line going across is the globally available carrying capacity. If everybody in Marin lived our lifestyles, there would, it would take five Earths to support everybody. And even the developed countries, Japan, Italy, look, they're like about a third of what we have. Another thing I found very shocking, 70% of Marin's carbon footprint comes from the residents. It's not the government. It's not the businesses. It's us. Marin residents drive 2 billion miles a year. The average U.S. home leaks so much air. Now imagine that you're going down, it's cold outside. You're going down, you turn your thermostat on in the winter time. Most of our homes leak so much air, it's like you left the window open upstairs. And we wonder why we're cold in the winter, even though the furnace is on. Secondly, okay, let's go, we get up in the morning and we go in to take a shower. So you turn on the water, right? And you've got to figure your greenhouse gases, you're using CO2, right? Because you're heating the water, your gas moves down to heating water, and that's causing carbon emissions. But what you probably don't know is that the largest single use of energy and greenhouse gas emissions in the county is pumping the water back up to the water tank. The ones we see driving on 101, the water's got to get back up there so it can be gravity fed down to your home. More carbon. And then there's our consumption. And in Marin, because there's more affluence here, there's more purchasing of things and there's more waste. So the bad news are, is that we're a big part of the problem. The good news is that we can be a big part of the solution. And those of you who have been listening to some of the other talks today, I think you've heard about climate action plans that cities and towns and the county are required to do by um, AB 32 legislation on climate change. And it basically requires every municipality in the state of California to um, figure out what the carbon emissions are and to reduce it, to create a plan to reduce it. The city of San Rafael has put resilient neighborhoods into its climate action plan as a way to help residents reduce their carbon emissions. And Mill Valley, we hope, will follow suit, Fairfax, and San Anselmo. So there's two parts of climate change that Resilient Neighborhoods works on. The first one is what you've been hearing a lot about today. Mitigation is the technical word for it, and it's the reducing carbon. But there's another piece of this too, and it's called adaptation. And for instance, um, and it's also what we refer to as resilience. My husband and I were at Mount Rainier over the summer, and we asked the park ranger what all the scientists were doing. They were running around with butterfly nets and looking at flowers. And um, what they were doing was seeing, looking at the life cycles of the different animals and plants that live there um, to see how they were being affected by climate change, how they were adapting. For instance, had the flowers that the butterflies fed on already bloomed before the butterflies hatched? Were the animals having to move further and further up the mountain to keep the habitat that they needed to survive? These are all adaptation things that animals and plants are already doing. So the question is, what are humans doing? And this is where we, Resilient Neighborhoods comes in again. There was an article in the January New Yorker magazine. It was called Adaptation, How Cities Can Climate Proof. And in that article, it talked to, they went looked at cities around the world and 
Um, they're talking a lot about infrastructure, the dikes, the dams, how to keep the, the um, subways from flooding, that sort of thing. But they also talked about scientists combing over the reports of climate spawned activities or, or events like the Chicago heat wave, Sandy Katrina, and they were looking for patterns in neighborhoods that were similar and why there were so many deaths in one of the neighborhoods and in the other neighborhood people were fine. And what they found was it was the neighborhoods where people knew their neighbors, where people looked out for one another, where maybe there was a local business or church or something where people could congregate and that business owner was local and knew the neighbors and would come back and open up shop even though there had been a disaster. Those were the neighborhoods where people survived and they called that social infrastructure. The, the survival rate was higher when there was social infrastructure. That's another thing that Resilient Neighborhoods does. We build social infrastructure by getting neighbors to know one another, look out for one another, support local business, and support the local economy. So let's look at resilience. What is resilience? This is the definition I like. The ability to respond with flexibility and strength as local and global conditions inevitably change. I'm gonna give you some scenarios now to help you think about how resilient your family is, your community, your neighborhood. So imagine this. Um, you hear on the news that a Category 5 earthquake is coming through the Gulf. This time it goes by New Orleans and it slams into Houston where two-thirds of the oil refining capacity for the country is. Three weeks later, the prices are $23 a gallon for gas, and people are freaking out. They're waiting in long lines, and even when they get up to get gas, they can't always afford to fill their tank. So maybe you've been through resilient neighborhoods, and you've decided to go and buy an electric vehicle. So your neighbors are paying a dollar, like for a gallon of gas, and you're paying two cents. So maybe through that social infrastructure, you can give your neighbors a ride to the grocery store, and maybe they'll chip in a few heads of lettuce for your family. Um, another thing that we do, we encourage people to, to um, shop at the farmer's markets. Imagine that you've gone to the farmer's markets a lot. You know the farmers there, and in this place where the trucks are going to have trouble bringing in food, right? They're paying all that money for gasoline too. You get to know some of the farmers and they give you the food. They let you kind of cut in line because you're a regular customer. Conserving resources. This reminds me of this spring when we've had so little rain. Imagine that it's the third year of drought in California and there's water wars cropping up everywhere. And you hear on the radio that Sonoma Water Agency has just cut all the water for its Marin, for Marin, basically. Um, and if you're in MMWD territory, we get 25% of, of our water comes from Sonoma County. In the North Bay Water District, it's 80%. So Sonoma is going to serve its customers first. So we could be in a very, very dire straits here. But once again, imagine that you and so many other people in Marin have gone through resilient neighborhoods who just conserved water on your own, that we're doing okay. We have enough water left in our reservoirs. We've created that resilience. And then um, this scenario. Imagine you're at a meeting in San Francisco, it's two o'clock in the afternoon, and everything starts shaking. You jump under the table with everybody else in duck cover hold, and you hear glass shattering, you see books coming off bookcases, file drawers, cabinets coming open, and it just keeps shaking. And then everything stops, and you realize it was a big one. Someone turns on a radio, and the report says that it will take people from Iran three days to get home. And you stop and you think about what the situation means to you. Your daughter's going to be leaving to come home from school in an hour. 
and she requires medication every night. And from going through Resilient Neighborhoods program, you know that your neighbor has a key, knows about your daughter, knows about the medication, and will take care of her. And the last, of course, when you're reducing your energy, you're reducing your water, you're reducing your waste, you're reducing your consumption and making different choices, you save money. So how does the program work? It's done with a team, that's why it's successful. Five to eight households get together and form this what we call an eco-team, and each household commits to attending five meetings, trying to reduce at least 5,000 pounds of carbon emissions, and take community actions to build resilience. It's kind of like the Weight Watchers program. We get people to go on a low carbon diet to reduce 5,000 pounds in 60 days. And what everybody does is um, they do their starting emissions, like you weigh in for Weight Watchers, figure out what your starting emissions are, and then you go through, we have like 72 different actions. So each family, each household chooses what's right for them. And you choose how you can reduce those 5,000 pounds and also earn resilience points, like doing a household emergency preparedness uh, plan. You take the actions in between the meetings and then weigh in again and celebrate success at the end. These are the areas that we work on for our um, carbon reducing actions, driving and flying less, decreasing energy use, making home improvements, decreasing water and waste and for the resilience building actions. Preparing for emergencies, supporting local business and agriculture, making informed purchasing decisions, and knowing and looking out for your neighbors. So we have, it's not just neighborhood teams, we also have um, friends can get together and do a team. We have neighborhood associations do teams. And I, one of the things I really love is each team names itself. This is the Hillcrest Gang, because they all lived on Hillcrest Avenue in San Rafael. This is a government team um, of employees started by Corey Bittoff, right here, front row. And um, that's the assistant city manager on the left of the city of San Rafael and the director of community development. And notice the great name. And our business teams, that people do the program during their lunch hour at the office so they don't have to go anywhere. The San Rafael City Hall Carbon Annihilators. We have faith-based teams. Groups get together from church or synagogue. This is the Deep Green UUs Unitarian Universalists. And we have business teams. This one we did at Marine Clean Energy. And uh, MCE is our acronym, so they're the Marine Carbon Exterminators. As was mentioned earlier, last year was our pilot program. And we had, uh, our goal was to have 100 households reduce 500,000 pounds of carbon. We had 106 households reduce 1.3 million. And we'd ask each household to reduce about 5,000 pounds, and our average was 11,000. This is, again makes me really proud of Marin residents. The other thing that we do is the data that we collect from what our households have done and our teams have done we separate it out so we can feed it back to the municipalities, the cities, the towns, and show what the residents have done as part of that city's climate action plan. In other words, a city's climate action plan includes what the government can do, which is like put solar panels on public garages or get electric vehicles as part of the city's fleet, that sort of thing. And you then you have the residential carbon emissions, which is what we do with our program, and then you have business carbon emissions, and there's a program for that called Greening for Profit. So our part can be fed into the cities and towns saying what the residents have been successful in reducing. And there again, um, Autodesk, the Autodesk Carbon Nun team, and the Fairfax Low Carbonators, our first Fairfax team. These were the results so far by municipality. And I'd like you to just imagine this with me for a moment. Think about 
if Marin County can do what I think Marin County can do, the people here, imagine driving into every town or city, let's say the, um, let's say city of San Rafael, where it says city of San Rafael, welcome, population 56,000, and under that it would say the 2020 carbon reduction goal, 21%, and the progress so far. So the, the residents, the government, and the business are all chipping in to show what can be done about climate change. And I really believe that this is a model that Marin could create if all the cities and towns and the county get into it and we could really show the rest of the country what we can do. So we need to take action now because with climate change, we're all in this together. And our program is fun, it's free, and it's rewarding. So sign up for a team and help lose those ugly, unwanted carbon pounds. So um, here's some contact information. We have a booth outside. And if anybody is interested in signing up for a team or just getting, getting more information um, from us, we have some note cards. Just raise your hand and we'll give you a note card. Um, he's got some there if anybody's interested. Over here and over there. Um, anyway, and so I can answer any questions um, that you have while people are getting the note cards. Questions from anybody? No, get back there. People serve on local teams, for instance, might be at your business event It would probably be difficult to do because the um, you probably would need to be on one or the other, but you could do it, um, say you wanted to do a business team, because you're doing it with your, your household, so you'd be doing it double. But you could get one started in your neighborhood after you had the experience of doing it your business. And then uh, you could be what we call a, an organizer, a team organizer. And we do um, a, a lot of matchmaking, too, um, where we find out, we ask you to put your street down, um, and your city, and even if you don't have people right around you, we can match you up with other people. So, any more questions? And I've got to, um, I've, I've got to wrap. Can I do one more question? One more question, and then I'll. We don't, um, uh, we give an overview about climate change, but it's kind of two different things that people really need to put their energy into getting nationally and globally something done. And I'm a total member and supporter of 350.org, the Citizens Climate Lobby and all that. Um, what is significant is in doing this program, you can actually see that uh, reducing a shower, to five minutes reduces 350 pounds. Is that going to save the world? No. But people take responsibility for what they've done, and once you you feel good at having done it, and, it, and it's empowering to then go and want to keep going from there and maybe working on national things as well, um, as well as building the community resilience which we need for adaptation. Thank you all very much. so much, Tara. And I mean, I, I know coming from the Gulf Coast, where we have to be very resilient, just talking to my dad last night, he goes, we just had the BP oil spill anniversary, we're all geared up and nervous about hurricane season, and they know back there, we have to take care of each other, and knowing your neighbors and working together, what a wonderful way to put this all together. So thanks, Tom.